um, virtual greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your attendance, which is um, a testament to the relevance of the topic we are going to explore tonight with one of the world's leading authorities, Professor Mohammed Salah Abdel Wahab. Uh, we have around 300 attendees from all over the world who just needed to click a few buttons to connect and exchange views. Uh, so again, OZR is very, very relevant. And with this, I need to extend my thanks to Kursika and uh, the CIR of Egypt branch for facilitating this very important opportunity. ODR is not an option anymore. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis, if anything, was instrumental in revealing its already increasing importance, as well as shed the light on a big vacuum in the Middle East region. Personally, I find that we live very, very exciting times as our ancestors lived through the Industrial Revolution and witnessed the world change. We have been and continue to witness sweeping changes in the way things are done. Kids do not, do not understand how we function without a GPS, mobile phones, or the current uh, breed of laptops. And with conflict being in the nature of life, conflict resolution followed suit and has branched into online dispute resolution, a field of its own. A field that is not just a virtual reverberation of ODR, as Professor Abdel Wahab puts it. These changes are not without risks. Many jobs, not only legal, will be eradicated. A new way of life must be found, and the road towards it can be very bumpy. However, I believe the future is brighter. With the globalization of ODR, an expression coined by our very special guest tonight, and with the rapid changes it is bringing, the face of the law and the legal profession is bound to improve with the law becoming more simple and accessible in order to face the continuously changing realities. Young lawyers are now learning to code International law firms are heavily investing in technology, just to cite a few of the changes that technology and ODR are bringing. Without further ado, I'm very pleased to present a learned professor who walks his own talk by remaining modest, striving to learn, maintaining the highest ethical standards, and sharing with rare generosity his knowledge. We have tonight Professor Abdel Wahab, who is a founding partner and head of international arbitration Construction and Energy Groups at Zulfikar and Partners Law Firm, the Chair of Private International Law and Professor of International Arbitration in Cairo University. He's also a member of the ICA Governing Board, Kursika Advisory Committee, MIAC Advisory Board, CMAC Court of Arbitration, Board of Trustees of the CIR, CIAC African Users Council, Arbitrator Intelligence Board of Advisors, and the Governing Board of International Council on Online Dispute Resolution. He also is the Vice President of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, Senior Vice Chair of the IBA Arab Regional Forum, Vice Chair of the ICDS Academic Forum, Dean and Member of the Advisory Council of the Africa Arbitration Committee, International Expert Member of the China Permanent Forum on Construction Law, and Fellow of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at the University of Massachusetts. He is also a seasoned practitioner who served as arbitrator, counsel uh, and legal expert in more than 200 cases involving African, Asian, Canadian, Middle Eastern and US parties. He was the African personality of June 2018 by Africa Arbitration and the Lagos Court of Arbitration in May 2019. He received the Law Magazine 2017 Best Legal Practitioner Award, the 2018 ASA International Arbitration Advocacy Prize, the 2019 AYA Hall of Fame African Arbitrator Award, the 2020 Client Choice International Award. He also features in well-renowned legal directories such as Who's Who Legal Thought Leaders, International Arbitration 2017-2020, Africa's 100 list of leading African arbitration practitioners by IR. And some of the uh, well-deserved recognitions he received, the Legal 500 in 2019 states he's one of the best in the world. Who's, who's Legal Arbitration 2020 says he is at the top of the market and a very well-prepared, exceptional arbitrator. It says in all construction 2019-2020 that he is a leading heavyweight construction law specialist whose analytical skills are second to none. Client Choice International 2020 by Lexology says Mohammed outshines his competitors. He is world-class. He is one of the most brilliant legal brains of his generation, an impressive, proactive, a very good speaker, and a very impartial and independent arbitrator. He was nominated four times in 2013, 14, 18, 19 for the Global Arbitration Review Award for the Best Arbitration Lecture Speech 
and was also nominated in 2020 for the GAR COVID-19 Pandemic Response Award. Uh, as ve very relevant to the topic, he has authored no less than 15 publications on ODR and is the co-editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Online Dispute Resolution. He also is the co-editor with Ethan Katcha and Daniel Rainey of the leading treatise Online Dispute Resolution uh, Theory and Practice, which received the CPR Award for Best Dispute Resolution Work in 2013, with, an, uh, with a new edition expected in early 2021. His most recent contribution was in May 2020 with his article, The Abdel Wahab Pandemic Pathway to Virtual Healings, published in the Global Arbitration Review. And engineered by synchronicity, not by ODR, the Kursi Katim found during its archiving effort a presentation by Professor Abdel Wahab in the fourth UN Forum on Online Dispute Resolution of 2006, where he was making the point that ODR is a reality long before we awoke to it in the region with the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, I invite you to uh, watch, to have a look at this uh, short snippet. My uh, presentation uh, takes a different avenue and a different dimension to some extent, which I, I found to be uh, appealing over the past two days when we hold the course. We held the course, uh, uh, the first international course on online dispute resolution. With respect to online dispute resolution, online arbitration, there are phases of the development where everything is communicated online. We can have hearings and proceedings online in the form of uh, video conferencing, teleconferencing or whatever. And then to a fully fledged ODR system where everything is from, or the AAA, everything is conducted online, uh, online mainly, and paper-based becomes the exception. Uh, and the default global nature of these ODR services and systems are very clear. Uh, that is around the clock access and availability for all the citizens of the internet or people who use the internet or cyberspace uh, as part of their life. ODR is not exclusive for cyberspace or e-commerce or e-business and it does not exclude other means. If in that part of the world we are not still familiar with the concept of ODR in principle, this does not mean that it's not a reality elsewhere. It is a reality and it does exist, so it's not in principle a dream anymore. Well, those words could have not been more accurate. Now with the COVID the revolution, we are eager to see if it's a blessing in disguise when it comes to ODR. Professor Abdel Wahab, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fatma. I am speechless, and I'm speechless again because of the Kursika team's efforts. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing this video. Um, I actually don't recall. Uh, I look at myself before I've done my uh, sleep operation, and it's it's uh, interesting. Uh, I'm very grateful. I think uh, it's very difficult for me to put me actually off balance. Uh, but let me start. I'm very grateful for those who joined us and for again inviting me to speak on this topic, online dispute resolution and the COVID-19 revolution. Um, and as the title suggests, I think that the choice was in coordination with Kursika uh, that what is ODR? What are we doing? And did COVID-19 have a positive negative impact? Um, this presentation today is different. And those who uh, may have seen or followed recent presentations that I have done uh, in relation specifically to the impact of COVID-19 on arbitration or virtual hearings will find this completely different. So what I ask of our colleagues uh, and participants is to bear with me during this presentation because I will start on a different note um, and then we'll get into uh, the details, uh, heavy details of stuff as a matter of law and practice. Uh, what I promise is the following. After this presentation, I think we will all leave with... Um, thoughts about where we are heading as a world and where artificial intelligence is taking us. Let me start. I have some slides I would like to share with you. Uh, so let me start by putting the share screen so that you can all follow me. So the first thing, as I mentioned, it's going to be a little bit unconventional. So this is my prepare for an unconventional approach there. Normally, I would have an outline uh, setting out the stage of what I intend to discuss. It's a bit different this time. This is a question that I think we prepared a poll for. Our participants, what do they see in this? What is that? Uh, perhaps they can assist us with the poll. Um, 
starting on a, a funny note, if we can all see the poll, is it up there? Yes. So can I ask everyone to vote what they see in this uh, picture, actually? Um, one funny thing that I included there, you see four different options. Uh, what do you see? And if we can ask everyone to vote and then publish the results, take just maybe 30 seconds. And then we can decide. Are the results published then? I like those who voted for Asgard. I'm, I'm into movies, those who know this about me. An energy bridge, a car. Well, 42% are absolutely right. Uh, this is a car. Uh, and you may wonder, what does this have to do with ODR? I'm coming, just so I'm asking you to bear with me. Uh, but there we go. This is the image of it. This is a Mercedes-Benz car, the uh, Avatar-inspired, um, a model that is in the making. Um, and we can now see, this is the first ever car built. You see the first one on the left-hand side. This is a Mercedes-Benz as well. 1886, the first ever car. Uh, now, this is what we see today. Uh, this is the visionary avatar that they have. This has nothing to do with Mercedes-Benz, but it's a, it's an Uber uh, fly taxi. So it's a taxi that flies and, again, is in the making uh, 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 in certain cities and countries across the globe. Again, bear with me about this because the commonality we've seen that they are more or less vehicles and we see the change over time. Again, in the foreseeable future, are we going to see a flying car in a way? People think that this is a science fiction, uh, but we'll get to see that. Moving forward, another question, ah, I think, what is that we don't need to, yes, what is in this picture? If I can ask people to vote, is it a radio, telephone, telegraph, camera? What is it? Perhaps we can publish the results. That's what I thought when I also saw it the first time I thought it's a telegraph. It looks like uh, using a Morse code, um, but actually it is not. It's the first telephone and it's what Graham Bell has uh, worked on as the first telephone we have. And today we have a handheld devices that are in the making, touch smartphones, whatever. Uh, the upcoming version of it is that you will have it like a malleable bracelet. Uh, a phone that is very thin, includes all the features over and above. And then again, uh, the model they're working on, which is a, an energy generating bracelet where you will have it on your skin, the uh, phone and the reference uh, to dialing, to doing all the features. It will no longer be handheld as such. What is the common theme and what does all this symbolize? Uh, when we look at the cars, the phones, and everything. The first thing is that change happens over time, the past, the present, and the future. And we look at this, at this uh, in O to wonder what advancement and technology we have reached. The second thing is that what we've seen is knowledge-based and scientifically informed inventions of sorts to modernize uh, what we have seen from the past and created to an extent in terms of be it automotive, audiovisual, whatever. And we've seen the relative uh, evolutionary path of this through either the examples I've given in terms of the cars and the phones. But what is lacking? Now, I'm not gonna answer that question now. I will answer it in the last few slides of my presentation. 
But I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because we will return to that because that will inform what I intend to mention and to share with you in terms of the concluding remarks on online dispute resolution. My presentation on ODR will, be, will fall squarely in three specific categories, the past, the present, and the future. And I thought it's important that we have this walk together through the past, the present, and hopefully consider the future, because a lot has been said during the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis ever it, uh, since it has hit the globe, that what we see, for example, in terms of uh, just holding the hearings virtually, uh, that is purely online dispute resolution, uh, using just email communications, that is online dispute resolution, we will put that to test. So that is why I thought it is best to start with the historical overview and evolution so that you are all aligned with me on certain facts that will inform the discussion on online dispute resolution. So let's start with the past. 1969 to 1992, the internet was invented, the Abranet, uh, which uh, again was used for academic and military purposes. Uh, disputes were very minimal. It was a closed, let me say, closed circuit population in a way. Uh, there was no issue. Uh, up until 1992, where the National Science Foundation was managing the internet, uh, lifted the ban over its commercial use. The internet, as it started, was not for commercial use, believe it or not. It was simply, again, for academic and military purposes. The ban was lifted in 1992. At that time, it was peaceful, limited online environment, no phishing, no spamming, no uh, music downloading, no buying and selling no multiplayers, no hacking as we know it today. Uh, cybersecurity issues were, were not as we know them today, all these matters. The 1992, we have the first internet service providers to offer commercial services. 1989 to 1995, the World Wide Web as we know it was invented and the first ISPs uh, provided graphical browsers. Uh, those who are familiar at the time, the new generation may not know that, the Netscape was the most popular browser. Amazon and eBay, uh, and many of you would know eBay, of course, as a, a market, online market community, were established in 1995, and the online population began to grow exponentially. Uh, now, based on latest statistics, we have more than 4.8 billion users worldwide with Asia having the, uh, uh, say, the largest share of 55% of internet users. 1996, 27 years after the creation of the internet, we have the first ever article on ODR, Online Dispute Resolution. In the law review, that was Ethan, Ethan Catch's article, who is, by the way, labeled, and you have his photo there, the father of online dispute resolution. Uh, Ethan published his article, Dispute Resolution in Cyberspace in Connecticut Law Review, uh, and then the National Center for Automated Information Research sponsored the first conference devoted to online dispute resolution. The first significant online dispute resolution projects were launched, the Virtual Magistrate, as an online arbitration platform uh, just moving the traditional arbitration online as a simulation of sorts. Then we have the online ombudsman office at the University of Massachusetts and a family dispute ODR project at the University of Maryland. 2001, Ethan Catch published his first book on online dispute resolution. And I'm holding it there. I know the virtual background may not give you clear visibility, but that was the book uh, published in 2001 and introduced the fourth party, which is technology, to the resolution of disputes. We all know that the parties to the disputes are figuratively referred to as the two parties. There could be more, of course. And then the neutral who helps them resolve the dispute as the third party. And then technology, the component in ODR, is the fourth party. Then 2002 onwards, we have more books and articles on ODR and the first ever online dispute resolution forum and the establishment of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe Expert Group 
And Colin Rule, who is also a leading figure in uh, the world of online dispute resolution, publishes his book in 2002, Dispute Resolution for Business. Again, there, uh, two uh, founding cornerstones of the field. Absolutely. 2001 was the year when Ethan's book was out there. I was uh, at the time doing my PhD in England and I left the PhD and focused on ODR to try and understand the field and started publishing in it and joined the group then. It was, it was my first ever speech, by the way, in Geneva. And you can probably see from the photo there. Then 1990s up until 2000, just to give you, rise in e-commerce disputes, um, spam, domain names, IPs, uh, Traditional dispute resolution was not considered at the time to be appropriate, and ODR was used to fill the vacuum. Now, at the time, people did not pay much attention to online dispute resolution because it was for high, val high volume, low value claims, marketplace. But the field has started to grow again exponentially, mostly at the time dedicated for cyberspace related disputes. Now, post social media, with the proliferation of online trading platforms, smartphones, and advanced ICTs, more closer to the reality we live in, uh, we have seen more complex disputes and ODR became a process tailored for both online and offline disputes, with also a focus on online dispute prevention systems, online dispute management systems, and online dispute resolution systems. 2010, the expert group we thought at the time of uh, hailing the UN and working with them on establishing an ODR working group in relation to online dispute resolution. And this is, by the way, the Ancestral Working Group 3, which is now the working group entrusted with investor state dispute settlement. Um, and they worked and until they finished their work in 2015 and the technical notes were released in 2016 uh, January. In that case, we've seen in the last decade uh, a movement from the human third party to an automated third party, to a fourth party. And this is not an anticipation on my side, nor is it science fiction. I will prove that to you. And we've seen also this accompanied by a move from small data, as we know it, normal type of computers, as we have it, to supercomputers and big data on the cloud. And I will address that. This is just to give you the ODR uh, uh, task force, the, the expert group on online dispute resolution, which involves states, working group number three, producing their outcome uh, uh, product in relation to the ID, uh, uh, ODR process. And it, by the way, just the takeaways for it, it's for cross-border low-value sales, services contracts, concluding using e-communications. That was the common consensus. Uh, it helped participants in an ODR system, and this includes the administrators, the platforms, the neutrals, and the parties. They reflected on principles of fairness, due process, transparency, accountability, but the uh, technical notes do not promote any practice of ODR as best practice, it's still in the making, nor is it binding nor suitable to be used as rules governing ODR proceedings. This was not a rule-based document like the Ancestral Rules on Governing Arbitration Proceedings. No, it's simply a, a, a technical note of principles that people uh, could review. Now, over the past decade, again, moving to the present, so this is the past so that you know where we're coming uh, uh, in terms of ODR, uh, we've been fighting to promote ODR to the world, to say that online dispute resolution is well above and beyond uh, using just simple electronic communications in traditional processes. But when COVID-19 hit, the world was forced into a situation of lockdown, restraint, um, curfews, and people had to work from home, live at their homes uh, for the fear of COVID-19. And in fact, until today, the very fact that we are on Zoom today is a testament that not everyone is comfortable with going out there. And so everyone acknowledged and believed. But amidst all this, everyone started referring to whatever is being done online as ODR. But as a matter of fact, and we will see that, it is much broader than this. Uh, at the time, 2010, because I was not aware of the video, I did mention that it's now it's an opportunity, but it will soon be a necessity 
well, the necessity has transpired, and this is where we stand. Now, the framework, again, I will not dwell much on this because I want to go into the more interesting stuff. For ODR, you need to have a proper framework. That is the technological factors, cultural and legal factors. The technological, of course, you need to have a proper infrastructure, connectivity, cyberspace, and now all the more data protection and privacy online. ICT and AI applications, I'm saying that because sometimes people do not distinguish information and communication technologies from artificial intelligence, and they are distinct, and I will come to that. And then we'll address the modus operandi of the technology used in ODR. So this is a, an indispensable framework. ODR does not work without technology. Then, of course, the cultural factors, trust and confidence, awareness, literacy, and the prevailing dispute resolution culture, which is the move from the traditional approach to dispute resolution, the transition into a paperless process, into the movement to a whole new subset of opportunities offered by online dispute resolution. And I know that many people contrast ODR with ADR, but ODR again encompasses online courts, and we will see that shortly. And then we have the legal factors. You need to have a proper legal regulatory framework for e-business, be it e-commerce laws, e-signature laws, or e-contracting acknowledgements. We know that in many parts of the globe, states are still sometimes grappling with acknowledging the value or evidential value of electronic communications and emails. But this is, by the way, changing at a very high accelerated pace, again, due to the COVID-19 uh, 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 situation. And then the legal factor in relation to e-dispute resolution and acknowledging the e-component in dispute resolution. And one specific aspect in which I have uh, uh, tried amongst others who have done uh, uh, excellent work in uh, dealing with virtual hearings, uh, to what extent do we have issues of uh, or problems or concerns about the legality of virtual hearings? And I think many laws across the globe have uh, embraced that. For example, uh, the United Arab Emirates Federal Arbitration Act, law number six of 2018, expressly refers to the use of information communication technologies and video conferencing to hold hearings. And that was two years before the pandemic hit. Um, the Jordanian arbitration law, the amendments that took place in 2018, also refer to the use of technology. And many arbitration rules, statutes and legislation across the globe are either being amended or practice and guidance notes are being put in place to say, well, you can proceed virtually to the extent that uh, cases are ready for this type of uh, uh, either hearings or e-proceedings in a way. Then we move to the $1 billion question. What is ODR? And I must confess here one thing. When we were discussing it at iCoder amongst the experts who've been in the field for 20 years or so, we don't have a unanimity. Believe it or not, there isn't. Some people say, well, any form of technology would qualify the process at ODR. So that is why I made it simple first. That's my first definition to you. We'll come to a more comprehensive one. Using technology to resolve disputes. I think this is the common denominator that people can agree on. Uh, to what extent and what level of technology is needed? What do we mean by use? All these come into play. Are we looking at an online medium? So is it simply because we are doing things online? Does that mean that it's ODR? Is technology used as a tool? Is it the type of the process that determines whether it's an online dispute resolution process or not? Uh, is in court excluded? What if courts adopt online technologies and use uh, applications to resolve disputes online with many courts now across the globe holding hearings uh, online. Let me tell you, for example, the Supreme Court in Nigeria has ruled that it is not unconstitutional to hold hearings uh, online. Um, and many, many other countries across the globe have been doing so. And I will uh, give you uh, further examples. And so this brings me to the dichotomy that uh, I had published years ago about technology-based, technology-assisted and technology-facilitated processes and out-of-court dispute settlement. And this is the spectrum that I proposed to you. It took me, I think this is the slide that took me yesterday, um, the, time, <laughs> the time to put it together. Uh, so here are the three components that I present to you. 
online facilitated or online dispute prevention schemes. I don't intend to dwell much uh, on this, but trust mark schemes, I escrows, credit card chargeback, evaluation systems, feedback, online complaints. These are all systems that were mandated by the online environment that businesses doing uh, conducting uh, deals online or online marketplaces or merchants who offer uh, uh, goods online. And I assume that since COVID-19, we have all been doing our fair share of online trading in terms of buying things online and delivering it to our homes in different parts of the globe. Um, all these are schemes that are considered ODP, online dispute prevention or technology facilitated uh, schemes in a way. How would you trust that merchant? How do you know? You look at the ratings, the feedback from others. Uh, uh, do they have in place a system for credit card charge back if they overcharged you? Uh, do you put the money in escrow until the goods are delivered? All this in place. Now, this is not encountered in traditional uh, offline type of trading, but is mandated by the online environment. And then we have the technology assisted ODR mechanisms. And here we have e-courts in place, and I will come to that, but let me start from the uh, easier part, online ombudsman proceedings. So online ombudsman in relation to complaint handling, doing it online is not something new and has been in existence. E-negotiations, and by the way, here there are many online dispute resolution providers that have e-negotiation platforms. Um, I don't want to name many, but we have more than 100 ODR providers worldwide, but I can give you one example is a blind bidding process where you input in a negotiation process uh, uh, offers about what you're willing to settle on. The other party does not see your offer. They also input their own proposal. And if they match, the case settles automatically. Or if they don't, it settles with the median if the range of difference, depending on the provider, ranges from 20 to 30 percent or so. So here you have an immediate on the spot resolution of a dispute based on the willingness of people to submit bids that are concealed, uh, not seen by the other or counterparty and settle it. There is, of course, e-mediation. And I think mediation has moved online with mediators doing their sessions online. So that is, an, again, one aspect of the process. And e-arbitration, which brings us to, again to the question of what constitutes e-arbitration? Is it simply holding the hearings online? Uh, all aspects of the process done online uh, is the agreement itself done online. Let me give an example. There is something now called the automated agents. We all sometimes receive spam emails about people selling you stuff and asking you to enter into a contract, uh, even though this may not be your field. I, for one, receive emails saying we are selling steel in certain parts of the world. Uh, are you interested to buy? Um, these are uh, automatically generated uh, uh, messages that are mass mailed to people across the globe through automated agents, uh, accompanied, if you respond, by a template agreement that is automatically generated that, if you agree, will be signed and the, the uh, deal is sealed. All this is automated and it does include arbitration agreements. So imagine if you have an automated agent making an offer, an automated agent surfing the net to accept the offer, and the offer and acceptance are done by machines or automated agents, uh, would that be binding in legal systems? A question that remains to be answered, but that is the case. We also now see predictive justice applications, uh, where in uh, huge cases or in certain in-court proceedings, um, there are the use of computers and artificial intelligence to give you predictive outcomes as to what the arbitrator or the judge will rule as to the, th sometimes even in the U.S., they have uh, 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 in one interesting case involving um, a criminal, the, uh, the artificial intelligence produced a report that if that person is released on bail, there is a 90 percent chance he would commit a crime. So this gives takes us back to the minority report movie and stuff. Should he be released or not? And the judge in that case is sitting in the U.S. Uh, when was present when he was presented with this artificial intelligence, he ultimately released the person on bail because he said, I'm not gonna trust 100% what the uh, application would tell me. But of course, it is indicative of the path that the world is taking nowadays in relation to these types of predictive applications in a way. And then we have e-courts and e-juries, and I will come to that in a moment, where you have 
uh, online uh, netizens, these are citizens on the internet, having problems and they resolve them through uh, crowd uh, juries where people register themselves as juries and they decide the case, be it a family dispute, a financial dispute. Uh, again, this is happening as we speak. And then e-courts. Um, and I will come to the e-courts because uh, I will first go to that slide before I go back to the uh, uh, base systems. This is, by the way, uh, uh, a snapshot from China. Um, this is an AI judge pilot project by the Beijing Internet Court. Now, just so you know, China is uh, very advanced in terms of using artificial intelligence. And my poll to you is the following. Let me ask you this. Between February and March 2020, how many online court sessions do you think the Chinese courts have held during this just one month period or one month and three weeks, if you wish, or uh, 17 days? But what do you think? Can you give us an answer? And this was during the pandemic. So I think it's interesting to see what people may think. It is something new. You know, you're holding court uh, sessions online. In many jurisdictions, you've had few instances where hearings have been held online, sessions. But in China, let us take this example. Can we publish the results? Very good. When, when, I, when I put the poll and the answer to these questions, I inserted the 55,000 specifically because I thought that this would be the number people will vote for. Uh, but it's not. It's the 110,000 that is correct. Um, so let me tell you the following. There have been more than 550,000 cases filed online across China. And these are statistics by the Supreme People Court in China. More than 440,000 payments done online in relation to those cases. They have held more than 110,000 court sessions and conducted more than 200,000 mediation, online mediations. So imagine this is just one case. And this is not just the end. In February 2020, the Beijing Internet Court published a procedural protocol of no less than 26 procedures spanning everything from logging in to protecting identities to dealing with the case. And it's not just the uh, Chinese. Saudi Arabia, for example, have also established, and the Ministry of Justice, for example, provided a guidance note on remote court hearings. But then comes my question, and many other jurisdictions to you. The AI judge pilot project. What you see in the photo there is an artificial intelligence form taking the form of a human being and... Uh, just assisting the parties with their case. And this is taking place as we speak. It's not something uh, 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 in the future. They are using intelligent synthesizing technologies of speech and image to help the Beijing Internet Court ju ju uh, judges complete basic work in certain instances, preparing cases, uh, uh, providing statistics, uh, looking at the arguments, all this. But also... We have the AI judge in the, sh in the uh, looks or image of a female, the voice and facial expressions and actions of a real person so that you feel a degree of relatedness in a way. It's not robotic. It looks human in a way. Um, and then it provides users and litigants uh, with an online litigation platform. And as you see, the, the judge sitting there is an AI judge and real people addressing their case. It's not a complex one. It's a small claim, but this allows judges to focus their time on more serious and more complicated matters. So this is the tip of the iceberg. Today, you're introducing this as support services. Tomorrow, this may be all about decision making and the human element disappearing, whether we like it or not. I'm not advocating for the disappearance of the human element. I, for one, as a human being, would like us to continue uh, to do our work as we are doing it. But the question, will we be doing it the same way? Are we going to be doing it? Or will artificial intelligence take over at least certain jobs in a way? And the statistics done in this respect is that 
They said that using artificial intelligence improves the quality and efficiency of judicial work and allows intelligent machines to conduct Q&A sessions, self-learning machines, being aware. And this is where the science fiction is now becoming a reality. So there you go. This is the present time. It is not the future. This takes me the ODR spectrum. Before I do that, I want to go back, and I think that's more important, to the technology-based mechanisms. Automated negotiations. I've given an example of the blind bidding. Advanced artificial intelligence solution set databases. Think of it this way. Ready-made meals that you can put in the oven and take them out to eat instantaneously. So you have, in certain cases, being of monetary value or certain complexity, artificial intelligence algorithms are being used to generate outcomes, preset solutions to the case, based on the knowledge base of decades of human dealings and excellent judicial brilliant minds of decisions, all fed into the system to generate solution set databases. Or the RM blockchain. Now, just to give an example, many of you would know about blockchain and uh, uh, Brandon Malone, our esteemed colleague, has given uh, a lecture at the, C uh, at the uh, Kursika and the CIR Egyptian branch about blockchain and smart contracts. But let me tell you the following. Where does ODR fit? I'll just give you two examples. Um, I'm not going to dwell on what blockchain entails, but of course, it's a technology uh, relating to cryptocurrency and more than that. But where does online dispute resolution fit? Let me give you two examples that will be eye-openers on what ODR terms or what blockchain users and dealers would consider to be the online arbitration or online dispute resolution variant of what we know. And I give you two things. There is something called the Clearos arbitration system, and that is meant to address smart contract related disputes. The Clearos process can be activated once a dispute arises in the execution of a smart contract. So it freezes the fund transfer under the spot contract until the conflict is resolved. Now, how is the conflict resolved? For this to occur, the parties would pre-select Clearos as a dispute resolution provider. Think of it as an arbitration agreement, as a dispute resolution agreement providing for Clearos dispute resolution in the smart contract. They agree on the basic features of the process. And despite the fact that this is called Clearos arbitration, what you would agree, for example, is the Clearos subcourt composed of individuals who will pass a decision, and they are called jurors, online jurors. The design of the dispute resolution system developed by Clearos emulates some of the characteristics of the blockchain environment. It is premised on crowdsourcing, which means using the wisdom of the crowd and game theory in economic terms. How is that done? Through jury voting. But how do you guarantee the jurors will vote or will have the expertise? That's, an, again, an essential question. Clearos offers a, right, a rights-based dispute resolution process, which results in a binary dichotomous resolution in favor of one party against the other. The process by which such resolution is reached is an aggregate of the votes of a large crowd of jurors who are specialists in subsets of blockchain disputes and smart contract disputes. So unlike and that, I think, is an essential component. Today, you may go to someone and say, you want to appoint X as an arbitrator in a construction dispute. X can tell you, I'm a construction specialist. How would you guarantee that that person knows the ABCs of construction or able to sit in the case? Well, you would know when you get the decision or see him uh, or her acting in the case or getting feedback ratings from others. But in this Clearos platform, if the juror registers themselves in a subset of a, a certain expertise, and they do not render the right decision that is expected uh, when you look at the aggregate of votes, that person is penalized and is considered to have breached the uh, duty to render a fair decision, and they will be fined financially because they advance certain coins uh, or tokens in the online environment. They will lose them, and they will be penalized further. So what happens here? is that you're operating within a structure that aims to ensure the integrity of the voting process through a tokenized incentive uh, uh, structure and additional measures. The parties can appeal the decision if they don't like it of the jurors, and they can do that several times. 
But how does the system operate? You will tell me, okay, then there is no an end, no finality. But each time the number of jurors will be doubled plus one. So this means you've got to pay more and deposit more funds to cover the appeal. And since costs would grow exponentially with this uh, increase in the number of jurors, it is expected that this would be an inhibiting factor for parties to appeal any decision. They will think more than twice before doing it. Another system is called Juris. Juris offers an open code dispute system using blockchain and Juris tokens. Again, the framework adopts a Juris code in their smart contract. What happens here is a three-tier process. The first one is a self-mediation with a selection of tools, including mediation between the parties to help them reach a consensual agreement over their dispute. Now, if that is not resolved, there is within the system something called SNAP, which is the simple neutral arbitrator pool. All these do not exist in traditional offline arbitration. And you see, this is a parallel universe of its own. So the SNAP is a process through which the parties receive a judgment by neutral, again, they call them jurors, who anonymously vote. But it's not just a simple voting. It's a reasoned voting. So the group of jurors provide an opinion, a reasoned brief opinion, on the case. After receiving the jurors' decision, the parties may then retreat to the self-consensual stage and try to reach an agreement if they don't want to implement the decision of the jurors. Now, what happens if they don't reach an agreement and they don't like this? You move to the final stage on the jurors' platform, which is the binding, binding panel. And panel here is an acronym for Preemptory Agreement for Neutral Expert Litigation. And this is very interesting. Despite calling it litigation, the twist is as follows. There is a judgment, call it an award. It is meant for the complex type of disputes with most experienced jurors who have the legal expertise and technological expertise. And here is the twist. You end up with a legally binding award enforceable under the New York Convention, which is known to people again as the single most important instrument for enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. So while this avenue is close to the SNAP, which is the second tier, the panel offers accessibility to enforcement under the New York Convention and can provide the parties with an award that is not only legally binding, but enforceable within the jurisdictions of the New York Convention. Now, the decision of the panel would be reached in 30 days, no more than 30 days. And the smart contract, if that is not the case, uh, it will be rescinded and the award will be automatically enforced. So you see that our traditional approach to dispute resolution is coming heavily under scrutiny with this approach. And these are just two providers of many with different approaches to ODR and blockchains. The AI judge system, we've looked into that. The AI neutral, robotics mediators and arbitrators, is that the future? This is what I call the technology-based online dispute resolution mechanisms, where the fourth party is threatening the very existence of the third party. This is a statement I'm making for the first time, but it's a reality. We are now being challenged and potentially replaced by AI. Now, we can say whatever we want, and I'm with you on this, that we want to maintain our jobs. But I will tell you in the concluding remarks, I will share with you something that will come as an extreme surprise to all of you. But hang on. So moving to the spectrum, what does ODR cover? We know that at least in arbitration world or in mediation, you can cover commercial, investment disputes, whatever. But ODR is well above and beyond that. It covers business to business, business to consumers, consumers to consumers, government to government, government to business, and government to consumers. And why did I put emphasis on government to government? Because I, for one, have seen a couple of years ago a system of an application on the basis of, uh, at the time presented, as a possibility uh, to uh, settle state-to-state -state disputes that are highly contentious, highly political, uh, where people are diametrically opposed and polarized. It builds on economic theories to reach an optimal win-win solution. So the artificial intelligence, you input your requirements, you share with the system the things that you do not wish to share with the other party, it comes up, up with your optimal position. And the other party does the same. The system does not share your 
views or their optimal resolution with, with the other party, but then being self-aware and conscious of your requirements, desires that you've inputted, it generates the optimal solution that is a win-win. Otherwise, the parties will lose on each side and then you can make up your decision. That is a wholly, fully-fledged artificial intelligence-based application. So this brings me again to what is ODR now from my perspective. I started by telling you using technology. This is the common denominator which all ODR practitioners can agree on. My version of it, and you can agree or disagree absolutely, is that now ODR has reached a stage based on what we've seen where you utilize state-of-the-art technologies that are integrated, embedded into the process that is wholly or at least substantially conducted online leading to a necessary revolutionary or revolutionary phase that is matching the transition to a paperless world. And you integrate, again, artificial intelligence as the fourth party. Now, this brings me to what I promised you, which is IT versus AI and the use of algorithms. Now, artificial intelligence and algorithm generally uh, is a detailed series of instructions for carrying out an operation or solving a problem. In non-technical terms, we use algorithms every day, like food recipes. This is an algorithm, by the way. Technically, computers use algorithms uh, to accomplish certain operations and problem uh, solving problems easily and quickly. And supercomputers, think of them as the serious super machines and not just the dummies we uh, many of us use. These are very serious pieces of work of artificial intelligence. One aspect, and I do not... I'm not going to dwell much on that, just not to waste everyone's time. There is something called the Nautilus. This was a project. Um, it was a supercomputer that they fed into it uh, 10 billion, 10 billion uh, images and views of uh, people and things, uh, more than 300 trillion uh, uh, um, uh, relationships, um, and then looked into the news from 1940 on, onwards, took that all on board, all the news, analyzed this, and generated certain predictions about human behavior in light of past practices over a period from 1940s up in 2015. Now, in 2015, it was, by the way, dismantled in a sense. Uh, but just to tell you, uh, it is said, and that is, you can check it online, that based on that, the Nautilus was able to predict the whereabouts uh, of Osama bin Laden within 200 kilometers that enabled the troops to capture uh, him at the time. So this is a very serious turn, not into the future, the present we're living in. And we need to see where this is going to carry us in a way. But again, big data and the clouds, these are large sets of data that are so voluminous that traditional data processing software cannot manage them. Cloud computing refers to the platform that allows you to access this, these sets of data. They're so voluminous. Just to give you an idea, the world's, the digital universe, the world's data in, 230, in, in 2013 was about 4.4 zettabytes. And I have a question for you on the zettabytes shortly. Uh, but the idea that I want you to compare is that over a period of seven years, we are now 10 times. It's more than 44 zettabytes. And what does that mean? Just so you know, it means uh, a lot in terms of this uh, uh, 88 billion years of music files, 1.4 billion years of HD videos. And I think I can share with you, it's more or less 6.6 uh, .6 stacks from the earth to the moon uh, uh, of data. So if you build up these stacks, 6.6 .6 times the distance between the earth and the moon. So just to give an idea about what the Zeta bytes, and I know uh, uh, many of us are not engineers or IT specialists, but we know about the kilobyte, we know about the megabyte, we know about the gigabyte, we know about the terabyte. Beyond that, there is the petabyte, the exabyte, and the zettabyte. And my question to you, look at the slide. That should be an easy question. How many terabytes, the, the big terabyte that we have, uh, in one zettabyte? Remember, we're talking about 44 zettabytes the data we have now. One zettabyte has how many terabytes? Can you have a look and vote? So the answer is in front of you. The question is of getting it right. Can we see the voting?
Do we have the results? Excellent. I think uh, we have excellent decision makers. It's indeed one billion. It's obvious when you look at the shadowed zeros and you look at them, it's absolutely nine zeros figure. But you can see that sometimes uh, uh, our eyes fail us in a way. But that's true. It is one billion. So one zeta byte when we talk about 44 and it's even more now because we are within the COVID-19 uh, 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 staying at home. Imagine one of zeta byte is one billion terabytes. Anyway, so the present again, this led because of what's happening across the globe, IT, AI and iCoder generally. Uh, iCoder, which is the International Council on Online Dispute Resolution as a nonprofit consortium, was established in 2017 uh, in one of the ODR forums that took place in uh, Paris. And you can see, of course, there Ethan Catch as well, the father of the ODR, the first person who uh, uh, ignited the spark uh, is there. And um, uh, uh, so are the others, Colin Rule and, and everyone else. Um, and then the idea was to create this iCoder in order to promote access use and public understanding of ODR, uh, engage with the development of ODR, uh, promulgate standards and best practices in ODR programs, uh, assist practitioners in becoming members uh, if they have an interest in online dispute resolution, uh, training, continuing education, mentoring. It is not administering cases. So this is not, not at all. It's simply a, a council to uh, enhance our knowledge and understanding of ODR and ensure that more or less practices are streamlined or within the vicinity of best practices. Here are some of the things you can look online in your free time, the iCoder video arbitration guidelines. And I know many institutions have done excellent work in relation to uh, 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 virtual or remote hearings, uh, the iCoder video mediation guidelines. Uh, you can check that the iCoder payment best practices and payment ODR standards. This is where technology kicks in heavily on technical terms in setting the standards. And of course, you can at your leisure look into that. Now, this takes me to the future. And you can see that I'm taking certain images and I will share with you each and every one. Now, the first one, AI and the brain. People talk about robots versus humans, artificial intelligence versus human intelligence. Well, the future, unfortunately, is not just about that. It's about the integration of artificial intelligence into the human brain. Think of it as neurochips that are going to be implanted to heighten and boost people's intelligence, memory loss, and believe it or not, they are using it now for restoration of optical nerves in eye surgeries uh, so that blind people can see, not in terms of their eye functioning, but they will be able, and there are uh, prototype uh, glasses that uh, blind people will now wear, and you come across you on the street, they will be able to see you, not just see you, to have an indication through the artificial intelligence application whether that person is hostile or not, uh, that person is happy or not, so look at the potential uh, privacy implications of this when someone wears these glasses in a way. So there is going to be an infusion between human and artificial intelligence based on these microchips. Whether these tests are going to be successful or not remains to be seen. What implications may this have is another thing. And you see on the right hand side, like a, 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 an energy belt. And this is my take on it in a funny way. Uh, we all see COVID-19. And despite all the uh, uh, views expressed by people across the globe on how it is transferred, uh, are we going to see viruses in the future transferred virtually to us? Not just virtual vi viruses infecting machines, infecting humans sitting in front of those machines based on energy pulses or electromagnetic or whatever. I hope not, but imagine what this would be like. So you can't go outside, you can't stay inside. Um, it's going to be devastating. And the third one is an image of a project. You look at the robot that is a little bit bluish there. Um, this is an image of a project called Discern, 
which is uh, a, a, a collaboration between the University of Texas at Austin and Yale University. Um, what they wanted to do is to mimic uh, human experiences in terms of neural impact and the dopamine, uh, 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 let's say, within the human body. The dopamine is responsible, by the way, it's a chemical substance that uh, the brain uses to stimulate uh, neuro and mobility functions, so many things about the body, the movement, the functions, high adrenaline, the feelings of goodness, uh, a lot of things. So what they did is that they brought this robot and they, one of the main instructions, uh, it's a self-learning in a way, they added uh, stories, historical uh, events, everything, and they told the robot not to forget anything of that. So the memory was working to memorize everything and nothing to be forgotten. What happened after that to test how the robot handled that instruction uh, and looking at these stories with fascination, it's self-learning in a way, is um, very interesting. We have the first schizophrenic robot. What happened is that the robot looked at some of these stories and the ones that apparently the robot liked or for some other reason, implanted itself into those stories and taken a role and believed that it is part of these stories and the storyline and the dramatis persona of this story. So it implanted itself as part of the figures, the story and uh, uh, the, the identities that in, uh, exist. So this was a very interesting uh, uh, test. You see that people are testing artificial intelligence and robotics across the board. Again, what implications this may have into the future? This brings me to the last picture there, which I hope we don't reach, uh, a robot holding the human skull. Um, I won't be alive at the time, but I think we need to be cautiously look into what we are wishing for and what we are doing uh, in a way. This brings me to the question that I promised you we, we need to consider, and I'm coming to an end, and I hope I, I, I've not imposed much on your time, which is uh, what you're looking at at the moment. Remember the cars, remember the phones, and what... Uh, is lacking. There is a common theme, which is said, change over time, knowledge-based and scientifically informed. What is lacking there? We're talking about uh, things that we anticipate will happen into the future, flying cars. But really, what is lacking in addition to this? You have three answers uh, that you can give. And if we can take the poll, belief, imagination, further scientific evidence about the future. When we're ready to publish the results, I'll be more than happy to see uh, what the majority of people would vote for. Until the voting is there, just so you know, over the billions of years that the earth has been in place, um, 1% represents the advancement of technology that we see today. And in that 1%, the most pollution of the earth has taken place during that 1%. Uh, belief, again, I inserted that thinking, ah, I'm really glad that I can think what people may vote for. Uh, I thought you would vote for belief, uh, but believe it or not, uh, and I see that there's a division there, it's actually imagination. Now, of course, we can see the bright side of it is that when you imagine something and believe that it will happen, most likely it will. Um, but let me share with you uh, the following. Imagination, that's true. And nonlinear creativity. And that's not my own view. It's what Albert Einstein, uh, decades ago, said. Imagination is more important than knowledge. It's this nonlinear creativity that makes a difference. Um, and this brings me to the point, why did I share with you? When we look about cars or phones, what we're thinking about in phones, for example, handheld devices. This is actually crippling and shackling our vision of how things may evolve. When we think about cars, we think, ab we think about devices that we need to ride, either through the air or to take us somewhere, self-driving. But who said that there may not be a time where we would have teleportation? Especially that today there have been successful uh, applications of teleporting data. Now, biologically, not yet. We have not been able to uh, teleport humans apart from science fiction. But this, again, part perhaps of another dimension that 
that is uh, 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 quantum teleportation and quantum entanglement, which, by the way, uh, Albert Einstein, when you read his books, called spooky in a way. But this brings me again now to the shocking reality. We talk about artificial intelligence. How can people think that they will be replaced by artificial intelligence? But let me share with you a very recent study that came about in, uh, out in October 2020, precisely during the first week, the press release. It's by Oracle. Check it. Workplace intelligence, artificial intelligence at work study. Now, this comes during the pandemic, which people label as the most stressful year ever. Surprisingly, they surveyed 12,347 employees, managers, HR leaders, C-level executives, and by the way, with different age categories, so it's not the youngsters, across 11 countries, the US, UK, UAE, France, Italy, Germany, India, Japan, China, Brazil, and Korea. Now, what does the survey says? What do you think? Now, we're talking about surveying people about a uh, uh, workplace study about their mental health. What percentage of people do you think believe, this is the survey of real people, robots can support their mental health better than human? So we're talking about mental health, emotional distress, mental distress. It's not something very tangible to measure. It's not about an arbitration case where you have X and Y or an expert report with mathematical calculations to uh, adopt. We're talking about emotions and neurosensors and mental health. Can you vote? Can we have a poll on this? Out of this large number, how many do you think? Answer first the first question, or you can answer both, actually. Percentage of people who believe that robots can support their mental health. And then another question, what percentage of people believe or prefer, actually prefer, to talk to a robot over a human manager about stress at work in 11 jurisdictions? So you have the percentages there. I, for one, if I'm voting for this, I would say zero. I would rather talk to a human <laughs> rather than talk to a robot. But anyway, we'll see what uh, the survey results show in this respect. Unless, of course, the human is someone you can't have a conversation with at all, then perhaps you don't talk to anyone. <laughs> um, can we publish the results then? Let's see your votes, whether it will coincide with this statistical study. So here we go. We have 20% says 8%, 40% uh, says 82 and uh, again, 40% says 88 uh, Perhaps this was part of my plan to provide an inceptive view in your mind so that you, when you vote consciously, uh, you would vote for high percentages. But anyway, what happens really is the following. The real percentage is as follows. 82% of the people uh, believe that robots can support their mental health better than humans. And for the second question, uh, it's... Uh, 68%. These are images I did not create. You can find them on the internet. 82% of the humans believe a robot can offer them uh, better advice and deal with their mental health. And 68% prefer to talk to a robot. And just to give you an idea, India and China, for example, the percentages are in the range of 91 to 92%. Japan is much lesser even though they are very advanced in technology, but these are people's perceptions. So now the shocking reality brings me to my last, uh, 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 let me, before we do that, why uh, people think this way, because they think robots offer a better uh, judgment, uh, uh, offer a judgment-free zone. They're not going to judge you. They're unbiased, provide quick answers to health questions. Now, if I take that, for example, into a traditional legal context of arbitration, Proceedings, for example, or court litigation, judgment-free zone, perhaps this is a version of being objective, no bias, uh, quick, efficient, and cost-effective process. Can that replace the human element? Well, some people believe so, not necessarily mean, but uh, again, are we conscious of our own biases in favoring or voting for the continuation of things as is compared to artificial intelligence? Again, the situation is for you to decide. 88% of people want AI solutions. 
Why? Because again, swift, automated administrative tasks, new skills to learn. But what they may not know is that in a very short period of time, they will be out of business. Their jobs will be taken in a way. And this is uh, happening um, as we speak. Uh, it is, again, part of either a reality that uh, we want to continue or something that we may wish to reconsider. Now, my concluding then remarks are what we traditionally perceive um, as a simple use of technology for online cyberspace disputes, uh, be it of defamation, small value, uh, high volume cases in a broader sense. This was traditionally the perception. Uh, but now ODR is not just ADR online. It encompasses court proceedings and out of court dispute prevention, management and resolution. This is a reality. Still, we're in the present. And the final thing is that AI applications apparently, and perhaps scaringly, becoming normative in dispute avoidance, management, and resolution with predictive justice applications, uh, applications that can digest voluminous documentation and brings you an output instantaneously. Uh, this is the real world we're living in. Now, how far we're going to go in light of that uh, and where we'll be carried forward, be it neurochips implanted in humans, uh, or perhaps a tribunal secretary as a robot in cases of arbitration uh, that can help you with the procedural background, distilling the parties' uh, submissions in a way, all this. Are we going to witness that? We've seen that in China, they have uh, an AI uh, judge who assists the judges with administrative tasks. Um, and my final question to you is what this device is, which looks... Uh, as a device there on the right hand side, what do you think there is? That's the final poll before I uh, conclude. What do you think that is? Is it a satellite mobile phone, uh, a lie detector device, a teleportation device, or a portable credit card machine? Again, these are prototypes. They're not for commercial use, but it tells you where the R&D, research and development, is heading and where we are effectively heading. And we can, of course, behind closed doors, sit and say the legal profession is not going to be impacted when, for example, the medical profession is uh, threatened by potentially robots who can do operations uh, with more precision and accuracy. But um, again, there are a myriad of choices out there and a lot of opportunities and a lot of concerns in this. Do we have the published results, what people think that is? Excellent. Um, that's, this is very close, but it is a prototype of a portable lie detector device. And you'll say, okay, what does this have to do with ODR? Let me give you an example. We know about witness testimony and witnesses testifying in arbitrations or in court proceedings. What happens if that is uh, widely proliferated or used uh, to check whether the witness uh, is saying the truth or not? Are we going to trust the results? The witness may be saying the truth, themselves, because this is what they believe as part of what they uh, convince themselves is the truth. And at the same time, are we going to rely on this or are we going to rely on still the intangible sense of the human element, the factor that artificial intelligence has not yet captured? Uh, whether it's ever going to capture or not is another thing, but this is the reality. Um, and the imagination that I uh, uh, was... Uh, referring to brings me to the final point about either holographic visual projections when we talk about virtual hearings or perhaps quantum teleportation, if that is ever going to happen. Um, I'm not sure where technology will take us, but this is just a snapshot of where we stand. And I stand ready, of course, to address any questions or views you may have. And I apologize that I've taken uh, much time and thank you for your patience. And thank you very much, Fatma, for uh, uh, for the very kind introduction and for the uh, time and the uh, moderation of this uh, session. Thank you. I can't hear you. Are you on mute? The common mistake we all make. You are, uh, I can't hear you, you are still on mute, actually. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. <laughs>
So actually, I wanted to thank you very much for um, this very informative presentation. Um, it took us, or at least me, to the multiverse and its different uh, possibilities. And I think we need some follow-up series events to expand on uh, several important points raised uh, in your unconventional presentation that prepares us for very unconventional times. Um, I believe there are lots of opportunities to tap into, but it uh, needs to be done quickly because we don't want to fall behind artificial intelligence. Stephen Hawking said to the BBC in 2014, the development of uh, full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. It would take off on its own and redesign itself as an ever-increasing rate, and humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded. I will not take this as pessimism, but rather as an inspiration to move forward and flow and embrace the changes. But the, the only alarming point, though, although, is the preference of artificial intelligence to human beings, which, in my opinion, is due to the deterioration of the human condition. And the hope is that despite the stress caused by um, the pandemic, it might help us make more informed choices that hopefully would uh, restore faith in humanity rather than us escaping towards robots. But I will still be very optimistic about the chances we have. I believe we have a few uh, virtual questions. And I'm uh, happy to answer them all. If you want, I can take them one by one, but I please. absolutely second what you say. And let me then recall the, the memorable words as well of uh, 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 Apple's uh, uh, CEO at the time, Tim Cook, when he said that I don't fear AI computers thinking like humans. What he fears is that humans thinking like computers uh, with no compassion. Uh, and I think this ties in with one of the questions that I'm happy to answer. So um, do you want me to take them one by one, perhaps? Yes, There's the please. first question from Mr. Amr Abdelhadi saying, as one of the best features, the New York Convention for the Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitrary Awards, of course, I agree with that. Do you think there'll be some barriers for ODR to gain such recognition? That is an excellent question. And the answer is there are barriers. And let me tell you one of the barriers realistically. When uh, the Answer Trial Working Group number three was discussing ODR principles and perhaps having rules, and one question that surfaced, okay, um, ODR or automated uh, decisions of sorts, are they going to be enforceable under the New York Convention? And here the delegations were split and views were split and there was no consensus. So there is this barrier does indeed exist. The question will fall squarely um, as to whether the countries uh, have uh, 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 provided any reservations. I think none of the two reservations, the commerciality, uh, reservation or the reciprocity uh, raises any concerns, but the point is the uh, use of technology and whether this was in contemplation. Let me tell you that in 2005, there is the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications and International Contracts. Article 20 of that convention says that it applies to the New York Convention. So they are taking the ICT component and applies it to uh, arbitral award in that sense. So it is still in its infancy stages, but gaining momentum quickly. Uh, the second question, uh, quickly, are ODR platforms secure enough to be reliable and trustworthy? And are humans ready to take the human factor out of the decision-making process? Sorry, excuse me. We seem to be having some technical issue. Uh, and I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Ismail uh, Selim and, until uh, Professor Abdelohed is back. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Fatma. Thank you. And thank you for uh, the excellent moderation of this uh, event. Oh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and uh, we're very grateful for Kursika to actually facilitate this presentation at this very important time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I, I see that uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdulhab is back. Good evening, Dr. Yeah. Abdulhab. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you very much for this uh, excellent lecture. Uh, so I will give you the floor uh, to Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. I apologize. Uh, I apologize. I think uh, I lost the questions because I, I, I rejoined. So perhaps Sotma can uh, educate me on the questions, and, I, and I'm happy to answer. Absolutely. Just... Yes. So... Um... The question you were reading was about ODR pl platforms, whether they were secure enough to be reliable 
reliable and trustworthy and yeah. are humans ready to take the human factor out of the decision making process as i'm saying i hope we're not ready yet but if they are taking the human factor out of emotions and mental health one could wonder what would not be taken out from the factor accordingly um mm -hmm. security is an issue and cyber security and integrity uh, there are a lot of for every let me say newton's third law of motion for every action there is a reaction equal in magnitude and opposite in direction basically um you have a patch for a security breach and then another day you have a new virus there is more than i think 400 uh, 45000 known viruses uh, in terms of computer viruses in a way so security remains a concern but there are protocols in place to at least include or provide for minimum uh, 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 guaranteed uh, uh, integrity and cyber security and there are many protocols in place uh, which I'm happy to share people with people if they are interested, uh, of course. And there is uh, ECA, by the way, ECA, Queen Mary, and uh, the Center for uh, uh, CPR in the US. They have combined forces and issued uh, a protocol on cybersecurity international arbitration. So people may wish to look into that as well. Um, sorry, any other questions? Yes. Um, so there's one on. Do you think that developing countries will benefit from ODR techniques like advanced countries? And if not, how can that be fair? Look, I mean, technology is not a level playing field. I think there is a lot of benefits from ODR, especially when you're trading online. You don't have the physical barriers. You don't have the cost of cross borders or uh, uh, movement of uh, non-E goods in a way. So there are opportunities for developing countries and people in those developing nations uh, to do business. Uh, so that is helpful to that extent. Now, technology, again, um, is, as we've seen, a double-edged sword, and it's up to people how they utilize it. But of course, if you hold the funds and the capital, you're able to ensure that uh, technology is on your side. Uh, so if you're going to invest in research and development and in technology, so be it, it's going to reap the benefits. Uh, but still, there will always be the people who have the capital will have the leverage and the upper hand when it comes to technology. Yes. So uh, another question is, in your opinion, is the use of AI eventually replacing judge arbitrators compatible with due process requirements? And despite the neutrality of these robots, do you think the justice will be seen to be done in these cases since the parties cannot discuss their case properly with the decision maker? Again, it's a function, that's an excellent question. Um, it's a function of perception. Uh, if we remember the imagination, we think of AI judges as the dummy robots we see today or as the dummy computers we see today. But self-learning machines uh, who may have an element of evoking or mimicking uh, human emotions to an extent, something scary, but it's, uh, it's not a distant uh, uh, possibility, there are uh, results. I, for one, do not wish the human element to be replaced since we're humans and we have our own biases to our own race, of course. Uh, but I think what we've seen on base of statistics, it seems that the lack of bias and the pure objective stance or stern uh, approach to things uh, may have been to the liking of some people voting in uh, regarding the mental health study. So it seems at least that we know instead of the world standing united and the human race is united about uh, a big no, no, there will be a division among people and a division on the borderline of not just 50-50. Um, I'm a bit concerned that we might be on the, on the side of the minority. So it is an unfortunate uh, a, a glimpse into the future. I'm hoping it's not a reality still. Uh, but that is only a subjective, uh, uh, consciously uh, biased views that I offer. Then we have a very interesting question. Uh, if a robot is hacked or got a virus while making a decision in any field, who would be liable for the mistake and how a sanction would be imposed on an artificial intelligence? It's an excellent, excellent question. Um, and let me tell you the following, and I don't want to take much time, but these are very interesting discussions. You have to distinguish between uh, robots or uh, machines that only act on the basis of input and programming in a way that you input instructions. So this means that in that sense, if there is a problem, this is the thing. And so the person liable on, in many legal system is the person who owns the thing or releases the thing. So there's the human ultimately. Um, but there are now situations where you see 
uh, self-learning, self-aware, self-integrating uh, robots in terms of importing and integrating their own feed-in data in that sense. And so we have even seen that, I think, if I recall correctly, Saudi Arabia has given the Saudi nationality to the first robot. Mm -hmm. So you're giving nationality to things, at least from our perspectives. Uh, we are now seeing in the U.S., for example, people who have been following, uh, I think three months ago in the U.S., there was a debate live on the rights of robots. Can you believe that? The rights of robots and debating the idea that robots should have rights. So it's not about animal rights or living organisms. We're talking about robot rights. So if you speak badly to a robot, will their feelings be hurt if they have feelings whatsoever? So we see now people talking about things that we traditionally believed are reserved for the human society and civilization. But this is the answer, is that we see now new forms of artificial intelligence that have uh, uh, morphosized into, uh, 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 what can I say, human-shaped uh, forms of uh, robots. I mean, this is the reality. Um, so there's also a question on uh, if, uh, as ODR evolving and becoming the general norm of the industry, will delocalized de arbitration prevail? Well, if I read correctly, the delocalized de version means that seatless arbitrations in a way or no venues. I think we already have ODR rules on online arbitration institutions, be it in China, Russia or the US, where they have really online arbitration fully conducted online. The seat is a legal fiction and it's kept there just to ensure which courts are courts of primary jurisdiction. But if courts are going to move online as well, one might think or invite a reconsideration of the legal perceptions of the seat altogether. So there will be a delocalized movement into the parallel universe of the internet. Uh, and that is where the traditional territorial being uh, geographical or fictional uh, approach to territory and seat may fall apart because you're without boundaries in a way. Which leads us into this question. Uh, do you think that ODR may raise jurisdictional issues or challenges? And what are the existing solutions for them, if any? I am yet to see a jurisdictional objection to ODR other than if we're talking about a clause in a contract providing for ODR and what falls within that scope or not. That's the only jurisdictional aspect I can think of. Other than that, I can think of enforceability problems, but not jurisdiction related problems. Uh, and the solution, of course, is that you will have, as this gains momentum, either more and more conventions or instruments that brings uh, countries of the world together. For example, there is a, a pilot project regarding the E-Apostille Convention, where you're talking about instead of taking a document to be legalized or apostilled in a, in a certain state physically, you circulate it electronically, free electronic circulation of documentation. Imagine whether this can apply to awards. So instead of you taking the award, submitting it to a Ministry of Justice to deposit it, you're not going to do that. What you're going to do is that you click send. The judge will send it to another judge in a different jurisdiction based on bilateral treaty of judicial cooperation. And no one is going to move from their place. And this I see as happening. I am going to I see. And my my again, my contribution to you today is that there will be free circulation of uh, judgments and awards in due course with the advent of uh, states buying into the system. Thank you. And a question on uh, preparation. So how should we as practitioners prepare ourselves for the future coming, particularly when everything is changing so fast? Should lectures on technology become more important in the law studies? I'll start from the easier part, which is the last part. I think definitely technology should be part of the curriculum. IT law should be part of the curriculum across all the legal curriculum. I think it's inevitable, unavoidable and a must. Um, the second part, where do we see ourselves in the profession? Let me tell you, based on a discussion I had with a very prominent Swiss arbitrator, um, the son wanted, and I'm being gender neutral, the son wanted uh, to go into law school. And the arbitrator opposed this firmly because the view expressed by that prominent arbitrator was that you will be jobless. You're not going to have a job. Uh, mm -hmm. In time, uh, 10 years down the road, and that person told me, I have the fear 
that the new generation could be out of business. I am not that dramatic or extremist about it because the way I see it with the advent of technology, of course, there are certain jobs that become obsolete, but this also opens the door for new stream of jobs, new services that may open the door. Uh, I think we can agree on one thing that in many countries, investment in IT, investment in technology has become a priority and the advent of studies to have a league of scientists dealing with artificial intelligence uh, is now on the high watermark and a very hot topic. I think for any organized form of society, law remains important. Uh, and so legal practitioners uh, will not be obsolete. The question is who these legal practitioners are going to be. Are they going to be us or robots? Yes, which actually leads me into a comment before I resume the questions. Uh, someone was saying it's all scary stuff, Professor Muhammad. It is scary. And I, and I align myself with that view. The question is, I always say this, uh, we can't turn a blind eye. We can't hide our heads in the sand. Uh, we should uh, confront these questions and have an open discussion as to know where we should be heading and perhaps advise uh, uh, leaders or people in the decision making whether it's the right time or the right approach to uh, 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 move in a certain direction. And perhaps people should be consulted on whether they want this to be happening or taking place or not. Totally. And um, then uh, two interesting questions about robots. So would it be fair to make another race and between brackets robots decide for us? And if a robot is self-improved, it may in the future be biased to his own race between brackets machine race. Uh, again, if they use the, 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 the <laughs> uh, his, again, we are again uh, uh, looking in a linear type of uh, uh, approach. I'm not sure his or her or it's or they or whatever they call themselves, the robots. But um, I think it's, it's, it would be, um, what can I say? I, I would not like us to think that we should have uh, robots take decisions for us as such, as human beings. I, for one, buy into technology, and I've been at the forefront of supporting technological advancement and speaking about technology as it goes, but I think sometimes we feel that things are spinning out of hand. I think technology can support, can help, can guide, can give us tools to assist, but to completely take over. And so our very existence become futile to use the Borg in uh, Star Trek, resistance is futile. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in the world where we become an obsolete race or an inferior race. Or I mean, it's it, it's going to be shocking, but uh, I don't know. Which actually leads us to the last question that says, on the premise that there may be human elements in the decision-making process that can never be replaced. Should the development of ODR be strictly limited? And secondly, if unlimited development of ODR is permitted, is it likely that ultimately robots could evolve unchecked into bad decision makers? It's an excellent question. And I think it proves that my, uh, 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 my discussion with you today on presentation must have left a mark. Uh, and, and let me take an immediate response to that, a short one, by saying, no, it should not limit or restrain ODR because if we choose an approach where the human element would remain the third neutral, third party neutral, with technology as the fourth party, this means there is room for both. The challenge is that if the fourth party threatens the very existence of the third party. So it's not about ODR, it's about the applications that are being developed to completely dispense with the human element or to move into the approach and the direction where these applications are to serve the needs of society and assist the human element in taking decisions when a third party intervention is needed. I, for one, for example, accept the fact that you can have fully automated negotiation systems, one-to-one, -one, generating win-win situations. But if you want to have the intervention of a third party neutral, a decision maker, I would like to think that the human element would continue to have a role to play. I think that's a neutral statement that I would make. I completely agree with you. As much as I enjoy the webinars, as much as I miss the human interaction and seeing people face to face, and I would never want that to be replaced. So I, I join my voice to yours. And um, thank you very much for this very, very informative presentation. Thank you very much and for your patience. And I fully align myself with I miss 
uh, to tell you the truth, I miss shaking hands with people. I miss uh, talking to people face to face. Uh, we all now have our concerns and fears. When you have a friend walking up, you still, should I approach them? Should I stay afar? The, these things, the things that we have taken for granted for a long period of time, I think we have now been shown that the threats by an invisible virus uh, is putting us back in place to see that we are not the creators. I think this is a very important message. Uh, but anyway, um, that's it. And I assume that we learn from our experiences and we will not have short memories uh, of the lessons to be learned and that we will make best use of technology to ensure that the double-edged sword is not going to be a cause of our very own extinction. Um, thank you very much, Fatma, and for the Kairi Center, Dr. Salim and uh, Ms. Rojdi and her excellent team. And I must say, I'm very grateful for the opening video. I would like to have a copy of that. Um, and I feel that I, <laughs> I'm gaining weight by staying at home as well. So I don't want to see myself as I've seen myself in the video again. So uh, hopefully not. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Ismail, you had a very important announcement to make. Thank you very much, Fatma. Um, uh, first, uh, to, to reply to Dr. Abdel Wahab regarding the opening video, you have it on your WhatsApp now, so you will find ah, it. Thank you. It's sent to you one hour ago. <laughs> thank so, you. So you have it as a short uh, video. It's. Um, I have to thank our archiving team at Corsica. Uh, uh, we we uh, we found uh, many uh, VHS videos that we were able to save and to uh, uh, to save on our uh, hard disks and our. Uh, 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 machines uh, to, to keep our history. And so you are uh, part uh, of Kursika's history, undeniably. Uh, and we found uh, several videos of yours uh, speaking in different conferences, and one of which was on uh, online dispute resolution, as you have seen, or several even. Uh, well, I have uh, an important uh, announcement. Uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, I requested from Dr. Mohammed Salah Abdul Wahab to link me with the specialist of online dispute resolution. So he was, uh, uh, he kindly introduced me to uh, Colin Rule, uh, who is the chairman and CEO of Arbitrade.com, which is a service provider of uh, uh, online dispute resolution. So I had a discussion with uh, Colin, uh, and uh, we discussed whether in Egypt and in the region we use fully online dispute resolution services. I told him not yet. Of course, we use video conferencing, uh, virtual hearings, but it's not what uh, Dr. Abdel Wahab have, has explained today, and it's not. This is not uh, uh, ODR as uh, uh, it, it exists. So um, I told him we should start with training people, training our arbitration uh, practitioners on fully online dispute resolution uh, uh, services. Uh, so he told me the training is a very good idea. So we decided that we, uh, Arbitrate.com and Kursika, would organize a training, a training on online dispute resolution. And, and we had the idea of um, introducing uh, our audience to such a training with this very valuable lecture. And I thank Dr. Abdul Wahab very, very much for this very valuable lecture. Uh, and I'm happy now to announce the dates of the training. You will receive uh, the flyer of the training very, very soon. Uh, I hope it's going to appear uh, next Sunday, uh, and I have to thank very much uh, the Kursika uh, conferences team and the Kursika IT teams uh, team. I thank them very much for uh, this uh, webinar, uh, for this very successful webinar, and I am certain you would notice that it was done even better than usual. Uh, we, 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 we were uh, very much keen on pampering Dr. Abdul Wahab, uh, uh, first with an excellent moderator like Fatma and also uh, to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, match uh, this uh, very valuable speaker and uh, uh, um, very uh, rich uh, lecture and uh, 
So that's why in terms of the technology used, the, the, the background, we have done our best in order to, to make it uh, materializing different than uh, usual. So I thank very much my team and I thank them also for their work uh, uh, and for their future work uh, to make the ODR training uh, uh, successful. So uh, the training uh, will be uh, co-organized by Arbitrate.com and Kursika. It will start on Monday, uh, 2nd of November uh, to Thursday, 5 of November. This will be the first week. Uh, every day, two hours from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Cairo time. Then the second week from Monday, 9 November to Thursday, 12 November from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. We will request, of course, from Dr. Abdel Wahab uh, some recordings uh, to be part of the training, even though because of Dr. Abdel Wahab's uh, very busy schedule, he will not be able to be with us uh, like today, but we will use some of his recordings uh, and uh, we will have um, uh, top leaders in the online dispute resolution, uh, Colin Rule, uh, Benjamin Davis, uh, and uh, uh, Mirez Philippe, and also uh, uh, Amy Schmitz. Um, so in this training, um, uh, we will offer a comprehensive overview of online arbitration best practices and standards, including clauses, arbitration clauses, rules, claims, and counterclaims, constitution of, of tribunals, and disclosures, as well as simulations focused on hearings, evidence, and cross-examinations. This training will provide hands-on opportunities to try out online arbitration tools, participate in simulated online hearings, and draft clauses and awards. Participants uh, in the full course will also receive certification in online arbitration from arbitrate.com. There is also an option to participate uh, in uh, some of the days and not all the training, but you will not receive the certificate in this uh, case. Uh, so uh, we welcome uh, those uh, practitioners who already have a significant experience in offline arbitration to uh, 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 participate in this online uh, arbitration uh, training. Uh, uh, so uh, we hope that we will have uh, uh, many, many participants. Uh, this is the announcement. Uh, so, and then you will wait for next uh, Sunday when you will receive the flyers, uh, the flyer of uh, the training. We will send it uh, by email and you will find it also on our social uh, media pages. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Abdelohab. See you very, very, very soon. Uh, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> Uh, so Thank you we'll... very much, Dr. Salim. Thank you very much and good luck with the training. You will be in very capable hands and uh, I'm delighted. Unfortunately, I'm in hearings, <laughs> in virtual hearings during that period, but oh. uh, definitely uh, I wish you all the very best. And um, I think the Corsica has took it to a completely different level with the ability um, to uh, navigate well during the COVID-19 in terms of uh, 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 enabling the arbitration snow piercer to continue. I call it the snow piercer because uh, when when courts sometimes stopped and closed their doors, arbitration continued uh, to be open to render services. And I think the Corsica uh, managed that very efficiently. So uh, uh, kudos and uh, uh, grand, grand, grand thanks and congratulations to everyone at the Corsica uh, with uh, great, great uh, pleasure. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I spoke too much today. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdelhab. So I leave the floor to uh, uh, Ms. Fatma Ibrahim. And thank you very much, Ms. Fatma, uh, for your enthusiasm uh, uh, and uh, your excellent moderation of this uh, uh, marvelous lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sirim, uh, Professor Abdel Wahab, Ms. Heba, and uh, the IT department. A very informative session, and we look forward to more. And uh, I wish the attendees a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.